Hey guys, welcome to the first De Novo Elements panel. Uh, this is the philosophy panel. I'm joined by Jake Orms, Chad Dolan, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, Ethan Schaltiger, and uh, Eric Helms. And first, I want to start by just thanking you guys for your submissions. We had some excellent questions. Uh, and yeah, I, I look forward to what we have in the coming months, but uh, this is... This is an awesome start, so hopefully you guys find them helpful, and uh, we will we will give you as much as we have in 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 our allotted time here. Um, the second thing I wanted to briefly address was there were a few questions that applied to other elements, so we're not ignoring them. We're just going to save them to where they fit. Like a few of them were supplement questions and um, other things regarding the other elements, so we'll address those later. That's it. So we we will get started and we'll get right into the questions. And our first one is how do you balance training and life when fitness isn't your profession? If living a quintessential corporate life, working 60 plus hours in an office setting per week and juggling family life, how do you manage the stress of missing training or being unable to train as much as you would like? So Chad, would you like to get us started on that one? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I don't exactly live a corporate life, but I live a graduate student life. So 60 hours a week at the university is a norm. And, you know, that's over a couple different job uh, descriptions. And then I also have my personal life with my family um, about a thousand miles away from me that I have to maintain. I have a, um, you know, romantic relationship with a woman. I have <laughs> my training. I have my, <laughs> I have my clients. So... You know, there's a lot of balls in the air, and I think everyone's going to use a different mechanism to Tell figure this out. That. <laughs> but ultimately, you just need to decide um, to you what you know are the top three avenues, basically, that you want to put the most time and energy into. What are the three most important things? Um, so, for me, for example, that's work, that's my clients, and then that's my girlfriend and my family. Um, I intentionally put my training in the back seat because I know, you know, fitness is not my profession. My success in life, whether it's academically, um, whether it's my research, whether it's my teaching, my relationship with my students, with my girlfriend, with my family members, none of that is predicated on my ability to move a barbell with a lot of weight on it. As much as I wish I was good at that and that <laughs> it was, you know, I'm very emotionally attached to training. I study it. You know, on multiple academic settings, it's it's basically my entire life, um, in a sense. As much as, as as much as I can get wrapped up in the little details, at the end of the day, I have a support system that constantly um, verifies that I am more than just my powerlifting total or my you know current body composition or whatever my athletic pursuit may be. So that was that was the biggest realization to me um, this last year is just recognizing. Um, you know, what is important in your life, what gives you fulfillment, make sure you put your time and energy there, and when you can train, you can train. That's not going anywhere. Um, but your family members, your professional opportunities, like, they will go somewhere if they're neglected. So I think one of the major things that you touched on, Chad, was um, about prioritization, and I think that's a parallel, not just with with training that, you know, we can talk about forever, probably. Um when we talk about training, but uh, it's something that you need to apply to life too, because uh, you do get to points where you realize that you can't always spend, you know, two three hours in the gym when real life demands, or as people call it, adulting starts starts to kick in and happen. And um, so I think I think at the root of that question, uh, in my opinion, and all things that you touched on, Chad, were. Um, spending some time really thinking about the things that you want to invest in hardest because the reality at this point as it is is that uh, powerlifting isn't a career directly for anybody um, and I think it can be a massive investment when you're in your early 20s and especially like teens um, but at a certain point there's other real demands of life that that happen uh, just like you said Chad relationships job um, all those other things so uh, yeah, I think I think that's an important key element to that. Um, anybody else have any any input there? Yes. Yeah, something to say, if you don't mind. Um, 
I like to kind of flip the script on this question because it's not the first time I've heard it. I think it's a very good question. I really like your answer, Chad. But I would say even when we're talking about a professional bodybuilder or a professional powerlifter who's literally at the top of the game and they are actually making income from the sport and fitness is their life, they are still organizing their training within some type of constraint. In a philosophical sense, I think we're all doing the same thing. And this comes back to the discussion of quote-unquote optimal. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the times we get lost in this concept of optimal because we don't understand that optimal is always within a certain model of constraint. So if you're a graduate student or if you're working 60 hours a week or if you have a family, you have to order your training within the things you must do. And that's even true for the pro bodybuilders and powerlifters. They still have to put gas in their car or do other things that require time. Um, and I think we always have to, in order to stay sane and uh, feel like we're doing what we need to be doing, work in that order of operations. If you work from here's on paper what I want to do first above all other things, you can then be disappointed with being unable to, to reach that, that impossible ideal that you set for yourself. However, if you start within the constraints of your life of what you must do, mm-hmm. then you can work out what can I do, and that's how you should train, prescribe, and, and program. Uh, and I think if you do that, then you will always be optimal within the quote-unquote constraints of your life. And I think that's a that's the way I try to explain it to my highly motivated uh, clients. Sure. Kind of get that backwards sometimes. And uh, taking that one step further, adding a little practicality to it, if you you know do exactly as Eric said, you map out your life on you know Google Calendar or a piece of paper, put segment block periods of time off you know this is work time nine to five this is dinner with wife this is pick up kids from school hold yourself to those deadlines be very specific with what you absolutely cannot do that there's no movement in and then if there's some fuzzy gray areas here and there that you know might be free time put that where your training is if you absolutely know that you want to train twice a week and you can make it happen with hard deadlines great, you have two sessions a week and then maybe some gray areas turns in, turn into a bench session or something like that or whatever it is you may do. But, you know, just applying everything we've said but putting it very practically, like that's a useful tool that I've used um, my first two years as a PhD student. It's blocking off time and being, you know, really holding myself accountable and harsh on those deadlines. Yeah. One thing I would add real quick yes. is I like having optionality. When I was doing my PhD, I was working part-time for a med tech company. I still had clients. It was, you know, like most students, you know, you go to the lab early, you got testing, you don't want to get home until late, or I'd have to run back and forth to work. So I figured out I could probably get in two pretty-ish, high-quality-ish sessions per week. So I looked at how many different places I could go lift. So I put a gym in my garage, which, again, for people, doesn't have to be anything crazy. It would be just a set of barbells to do deadlifts or kettlebells or whatever i literally had a kettlebell that lived under my desk i had like a a trx in my car i could exercise at the university where i was at and then in addition to that i bought a punch pass at a local gym if i was driving by there running back and forth between work i could stop in there and do a session so it's not ideal some of them are just you know nine o'clock at night i'm in the lab doing kettlebell swings you know but it was better than doing nothing i think a lot of times people will just throw their hands up and go well you know i can't do you know squats today as i planned so uh today's horrible well you know maybe i could do something else that is okay it's still better than you know nothing so just kind of looking to see where you can you know fit things in as best you can yeah uh again i i think uh an excellent key point of that is not getting lost in the all or nothing phenomenon which i think we've all kind of touched on a little bit in, in our answers and Like you said, Eric, uh, with highly motivated clients, I think you find often it's like um, getting lost in the uh, maybe false perception of the always having the optimal routine because otherwise you're not going to gain that that five pounds of pure muscle per year or or whatever you know circulates as as the the top end um, every I don't know every cycle of muscle magazines of whatever the new top end of muscle you could gain per year is um well just just for sake of being able to get through all of our questions uh let's (laughs) let's move on um 
Our second question is for an individual who has been training and wants to get into coaching, what should they follow as a guideline? And as guideline, they mean a path, their base morals, how to find clients, and any certifications um, that a coach should or could get for powerlifting or weightlifting or anything else related. So, Eric, would you like to start us off there? Certainly. Um, I think this actually comes back to the said principle, uh, specific adaptations to impose demands just applied to your career. Yep. Um, I like to work in advance and then look backwards. So think of where do I want to be in five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Sometimes this may not be an accurate representation of what will actually happen, but it could assist in planning. So if you know where you want to go, you can look back and figure out what steps you need to get there. And I think um, it's going to be more of a personal gripe, and I don't want to tangent too much, but I see a lot of people who oh, we're have going to. <laughs> great goals, strong desires, and they know where they want to go, but they don't have the patience required uh, and they put themselves in the position where they are, or rather they're positioning themselves on social media as an expert before they've really achieved that yeah. level of, of knowledge or expertise. And I think that's a mistake um, because first impressions are everything. And if uh, you make errors early on and try to be something you're not yet, uh, that can prevent you from actually getting to where you, you could be. So, Anyway, getting back off that little loop of my tangent, I would say start with where you want to go to and then figure out what will build your, your quote-unquote resume to get there. And that's not just the perception of people who want to work with you, but also the skill set you need. Figure out if it'd be appropriate to go an academic route uh, or do you need to try to intern with the coaching group that's already doing something similar to what you're doing. Um, build the experience and the knowledge you need and and I would even advise doing some, some free coaching at the start, maybe in just an exchange for um, a little bit of exposure or being able to, to soft advertise the, uh, the successes you hopefully will eventually have with your clients to get that experience because um, you need to learn how to work with people more than anything else. Learning yeah. exercise science and nutrition science is very low on my list compared to knowing how to build relationships. Um, and then you need to have some way to make all those things you're doing working towards that five-year plan visible, which is where social media comes in. Uh, and there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to do social media, but I would say if there was one thing close to being right, is that you won't want to be an accurate representation of what you're doing uh, rather than a false image. So uh, social media is pretty diverse these days, and I think you can probably pick the platform that matches your personality best, whatever you want to do long form video content on YouTube, you know, short form video and picture content on Instagram, in depth discussions uh, and mostly opinionated uh, discussions on Facebook, uh, <laughs> or, or some combination thereof. But uh, I do think it should match your personality and your goals and where you want to go. Um, and then the specific detail of what your education might be, what certifications you get, and, you know, how you get clients is really going to depend on where you're trying to go and who you want to target. Everything I did was focused on becoming a natural bodybuilding and powerlifting coach. So I only know how to do that, but that's probably too specific to be useful to uh, everyone watching. Um, I think that, yeah, that was an excellent holistic answer. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> the the only things that I, I would, I guess, like to, to highlight within that and um, really bring out more that that i see now with this i don't know coaching revolution almost of um i think everybody realizes that it's a possibility because social media is so accessible for everybody and they know that they now have a market if they if people lend lend them their ears for whatever reason um whether it be uh that they're followed because they have a great physique or because they they're entertaining or something else and i do think um, an important note in that is uh, it is very important to have some type of base before, just like you said, Eric, in, in communication and to some degree counseling, because you are working with other people. You're not just self-serving. Um, and I think if, if you truly want to be effective, and that will answer another question within his question, um, you need to be competent um, to be effective and th therefore you won't even need to sell yourself as much because people will spread the word for you um, if you're actually 
uh, doing well. I think pretty much everybody um, on this panel who, who is actively coaching, I mean, I know I could speak for at least Mike and, and Eric, like this, this all really started like over a decade ago. Um, so it's, it's not like just overnight, like everybody got a job doing this and it's this dream thing. And um, it just happens because you, you just say you're good at it and people just are knocking down the door. Um, yeah, it, it's, I think, I think the two key things, Eric, that you said are, are counseling and developing human relationships and also doing it softly, not just jumping right in and saying, let's go like, all right, coaching, like, and advertising the hell out of it. Um, because again, what we've seen at, at least what, what I've especially seen in the time I've been involved in, in fitness, uh, both as an athlete consumer and, and professional, uh, is that a lot of people, like a lot of us have probably gotten jobs because other people were doing things so crazy and they were messing, you know, people up. Um, so the whole point of all of this information being out there is absorb it and, and utilize it. And, um, as a whole, the entire, uh, community gets better, not just, uh, one individual. And, um, yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a huge theme is, is not just doing it because it's, it seems like it's convenient and you could work from home. <laughs> um, anybody else have any input on that question? I guess my only input, uh, would be like, like kind of what you touched on, Ben, like make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, because I feel like, like, I feel like if you're going to coach somebody, um, you sort of have to take on this responsibility for your athlete. And if you don't care about their training, like as much, if not more than your own, like you probably shouldn't be coaching them or be a coach, which maybe that sounds harsh, but I think making sure you have a solid, solid foundation of like why you want to be the coach is important as well. But Yeah, I I absolutely agree with that. Um, I want to give one last uh, opportunity for anybody else to touch on it before we move on. Anybody? I would just echo that and say that the, the biggest thing you can do is just to give a crap about your clients and actually care. Yep. I mean, I know that sounds like kind of really obvious, but if you do that you and don't know an answer, you'll figure out the answer, right? You'll go for whatever means you need to do to get an answer. But I think, uh, sadly, in fitness, there are some people that just do it because it's it's a, a job. So I think if you really care about the, the clients, just like everyone said, you're, you'll be moving in the right direction. And it is so highly competitive that I think almost people get the impression from the outside that it, it needs to be um, treating people as numbers rather than people. But right. I, I think that's a huge element is like, well, I'm, again, not to beat a dead horse, but but just ending on saying that, like, what actually separates you is caring about people, and that that alone will make you efficacious because it will make people. Then you can tangent into the whole emotional aspect of efficacy of training, and not the physical or the theoretical stuff. Um, but that that makes up for a huge amount of of actually having an intervention work if people like you and they want to follow it. Um, Jake, you've said so much. I mean, I, I want to get you to shut up, but anything on that one? Um, I mean, I pretty much agree with what everybody has said. Uh, one thing, I guess, one thing that I see a lot of people doing that, uh, might be something to watch out for or to ensure that you're not doing is, uh, you'll see these people that, well, kind of hop around to a bunch of different coaches to try to, I don't know, decipher uh, many methods of, of coaching and, I don't know, perhaps uh, create some sort of amalgam out of that. that <laughs> yes. That is what they're doing. Chimera of coaching. Uh, yeah. Um, well, just, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think you should, you should do that. And I don't, I don't think you should, uh, really try to coach unless you really understand what they're doing or the reasoning behind a certain methodology. Don't just try to uh, get 
coached by somebody so that you can try to decipher their method and then reapply that uh, in an, however many different contexts that are presented to you. It's like uh, like like competence by association, and that um, I think no one here has gotten their degree just by having a teacher that was accomplished. Um, that would be an interesting an interesting world. Um, can I can I comment on just a little more before absolutely point out going on this is a huge tangent. No, 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 go go. Actually, I really like what you said, Jacob. I think while there's absolutely nothing wrong with working with a mentor or modeling yourself off someone who you respect and that you think is doing it effectively and then learning from them. Uh, and I've seen many people who are clients learn something from their coach and then eventually apply their own coaching. That's totally fine. Hopping around to try to find the magic coaching equation is an in shows an inherent misunderstanding of the way coaching works. And that the longer you work with someone, the better your relationship is built, the better you understand their body and their mind, and the better you can help them. I don't care how good of a coach you are, your first couple of weeks with someone is not going to be that good. Yep. So if you're hopping from coach to coach waiting for someone to actually meet up to with their own hype, you're going to be disappointed every single time. Uh, because coaching should be something that gets better with time, not something where you just shop around and you find uh, the perfect thing. It's, it's not like buying a product. It's not like you try different shoes until you find the one that fits great. This is actually a relationship that you're looking to build. So I've Often when someone comes to me and they mention, oh, I've had these X different, X, Y, Z different coaches and it never worked out. My first thought is, yeah, I actually don't have any room in my roster. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <So>. I'm full. <laughs> yeah. um, funny, funny enough, I, I'd like to just one sentence end on the point of that's actually an interesting aspect in psychiatry is they talk about people who uh, come into a first appointment and they, they begin by saying, I've gone to, you know, X number of people and for this problem, like four or five different people. And oftentimes they say that that person um, is actually going to be the most treatment resistant because uh, every time they're, they're, they're getting potential things to help them, but th they're looking in the wrong places for, for something. It's almost like there's just, it's like incompatible. So... Um, Again, I think there's so many parallels with the emotional things and, and counseling with, with coaching. Um, okay, let's move on. Th uh, thank you guys. I, I think, man, we, we went beyond in that one. Um, but, but it was good. And, and I, I, I hope that everybody gets a lot um, who, who tunes in. Uh, next question is uh, from Justice Cousins. And... He said he'd like to know the panel's methods on some key things to keep in mind when co coaching clients remotely. Uh, what difference th things to consider when compared to coaching someone in person? Is there any research to support certain methods methods in regards to nuances with online coaching and communication that they apply? Uh, so we'll do the panel for that one. Um, Jake, would you like to start us on that? Man. I haven't heard of any, like, uh, I'm not aware of any, like, research that, uh, I guess, would apply to coaching from a distance or something like that. Uh, maybe everyone else has, but, uh, um, I, I don't know. I'll, the one thing for me, well, obviously, communication is going to be, like, the toughest part, I guess, since you can't be with them all the time. And... Uh, Coaching somebody that's more high level, I, I found that usually what ends up being the, the tough part of it is like, I, I would actually want to see most of their sets or something like that. And you can't uh, always do that um, unless you're just constantly having them send you video. I mean, that's, and that's up to you if you, if you want to do that with that person. Um, so I guess I have some people that I do that with, but uh, one of the things, yeah, is just I, I can't see it in the moment and, you know, you know, just kind of say like, you know, stop doing that, fix this maybe a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to do, do things really on the fly. I guess there's just a time lag in, uh, in some things. Yeah. <clears throat> Whoever wants to go next, I know, I know we all have an opinion on this. 
Yeah, I mean, I think one thing I can do in class to help my students, I try and do the uh, distance coaching, and it, it doesn't work as well. In class, they obviously are presented with the material visually in the book, um, visually from my slides, and then I sit there and I have a conversation with them. I, I tell them it auditorily, um, and usually people have, you know, some strengths and some weaknesses in those two realms of learning, but then together we go and we do things hands-on, um, so I do all the lab laboratory practical-based teaching things, and then that's when things start to click, is when they've they've seen it essentially three times, the three-pass method. Um, so with, with my online clients, I try and write them like a very visually descriptive cue, for example, um, if we're talking about technique, be very visually descriptive with the cue, um, film a quick video if needed, like me demonstrating it, me talking about what I'm thinking about, what I'm feeling, like showing them where to cue themselves physically since I can't be there, like Jake said, in real time to tech, technically cue them, you know, having someone retract their lats on a bench or move the load of the deadlift into their lats, um, you can do very easily with touch and like explaining something, but I can sit here and cue that for six months on the, on the computer and I won't visually see it until it really, really starts to happen. And, you know, that's, that's the hardest part is just figuring out, um, what three passes work best with each client. Everyone's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, I'm going to save my, my input for last. We'll just kind of go in, uh, we'll go clockwise. So Eric, Eric, you're next. Sure. Yeah. I think, I think the answer to this question is going to change as technology evolves. I remember when back in 2009, when we first started doing online coaching with 3DMJ, we used to really feel like we had to sell online coaching and talk about the pros versus cons. Um, and these days there's almost in my opinion, more pros versus cons in a global sense. Like if you are seeking out from the consumer perspective, a coach and you feel that you are not okay with online coaching. You definitely want someone in person. You are, in the worst case scenario, the negative connotation, you are susceptible to the local talent. Meaning yeah. that if there's not a good coach in your area, you're going to have a mediocre coach at best, yeah. uh, although you may have a slightly better delivery. But if you have access to the internet and you're willing to accept some of the minor cons of online coaching, then you can have a much broader pick of the litter, if you will, uh, and have a much better chance of getting a coach who uh, just knows what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, I guess in the current technological place we are, I, I think uh, a good coach can utilize unlisted YouTube videos, Skype or Google Hangouts, um, you know, like Google Sheets to have live program changing. Um, everyone has smartphones these days, especially for someone who's looking for online coaching. Uh, and like, like Chad said, uh, you can have some overlapping use of these tools to, to, to get as much as you can uh, across to a client. I think, especially when coaching uh, bodybuilders uh, going through, say, contest prep, where there's a strong emotional component that is the biggest uh, barrier sometimes to their success, at least during prep. Yep. Um, videos from clients and videos to clients have been absolute lifesavers for me in that they've allowed some of those subtle uh, communication uh, errors that occur just from uh, typing to come across verbally and, and visually from seeing the way I, I, I'm talking to them. and I can understand their mental state a little better when I can see how sunken in they are how slow yeah. the speech is and yeah it might look like death even though they're they're sounding very motivated in their text uh compared on the video so i think uh that has been to to be an effective online coach depending on the population you really have to take advantage of all the technological options you have available to you but but like like some of the other people have already mentioned um certain things you just can't do like i won't coach an olympic weightlifter on their technique on online. Uh, that's something I think anything that's highly skill dependent, I wouldn't do any like strength conditioning. Sure. Uh, coaching powers or bodybuilders where the skill level is important, but it's not incredibly important is one thing, but I wouldn't like try to work with a hammer. Th well, I wouldn't work with a hammer thrower ever cause I don't do that, but I wouldn't try to do like skill dependent coaching online because there's certain things you just can't get across unless you're in the same person in the same place with the person. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, Ethan, any, any input? 
Yeah, um, although just take what I say with a grain of salt, because I by far have the least experience with this out of everyone. Uh, but I actually uh, program for two of my friends, and uh, one of my friends, uh, we see each other basically every day, and so I don't really count that as an online interaction. Um, but my other friend, uh, we basically communicate through email and uh, I guess one thing that I keep in mind is kind of like what Jake was saying, um, you're not in person. And so the amount of information that you have is going to be limited. And so when I'm trying to make adjustments to his programming or, you know, his routine, I can't make these like giant changes. Like I have to be very careful with what I'm doing because like I'm not getting as much information as I want to, um, and so you just have to be careful that when you're making adjustments, like you, you're able to sort of <clears throat> tease out what is causing the changes and like, you know, whether the person is getting stronger, whether they're not making progress at all. Like, I guess that's, um, one thing that I try to keep in mind is like, trust the process and don't get ahead of myself when trying to make changes because like you don't have as much information as you might need in certain instances. Sure. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'm going to save just so, so I, I don't uh, derail anything. Um, so, uh, Mike, any, any additional input? Yeah, a couple things. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'm kind of old school in this, but I think people should have a fair amount or at least some in-person experience first before doing online. Yeah. I think now it's kind of cool and sexy to be the online trainer and, you know, like everyone said, there's some cool stuff you can do. Um, I mean, I know I made that mistake. Like in 2006, I hadn't worked with that many people in person. But I'm like, oh, online, I'm going to do online. This is going to be great. And it was an utter freaking debacle. It was horrible. I apologize to any of those people I worked with back then because it was a shit show. <laughs> um, and I stopped doing it because I realized that when, once I finally got video then, and it's much easier to get video now, I was like, oh my God, that's their squat? I didn't realize they could squat that bad because I didn't have enough experience with enough people coming through. Um, so it wasn't until I could figure out how to kind of measure the things I wanted to know online that I started doing it again. It took about three years to do that. Um, but real quick, as a side note for language stuff, there's a book called Motivational Interviewing. I think you can buy it on Amazon for four mm -hmm. bucks or something. It's boring as sin to read, but super, super useful. Um, even if you just take a couple of those skills out of there, I find for communication, that's super good. Um, like Eric said, I haven't done too much with video yet, but I've done a lot of stuff with audio, especially in the last year. And I found that that's been super useful. One, I started doing it because of my uh, time. And what I found was clients really liked the audio notes um, because they could get more background information if they're more into it, things of that. So I do a mix of audio um, and written. Um, now the last thing, I use a lot of heart rate variability, so people aren't familiar with that. It's a way of just measuring stress on your autonomic nervous system. So to give you a marker of stress from 1 to 100, gives you resting heart rate. So I'll do that each morning. Some update me every day, some update me weekly, it just depends. Um, if I could weigh my little magic wand, I would make that a requirement for everyone who's training online. Because when you're in person, you can tell by the person even just walking in the door. Like if I have some in-person sessions here, I don't know if my clients are listening to this, but I spy on them like through the window. <laughs> <laughs> and I watch them get out of their car and see how they move and stuff before they know someone's watching them. And that worked now. Uh, but you get a pretty good idea, right? You watch the warm-ups, you, you know, things like that. We're online. They could be super excited in their writing, but they could be just utterly obliviously stressed out of their mind, especially when you first start working with them. So I like that having a measure of where their stress is actually at, that one, for their awareness, we can make changes. And two, I can know right away if I'm you know pushing them too hard or their sleep is off or, or something's going on. Because in my experience, that's one of the hardest things to kind of tease out and it's very different from one person, you know, to the next. Um, so I found that that's been like super useful. Yeah, I think um, I don't really have anything to add. Uh, what what I would basically uh, just say as like a capstone to distill it down to the primary themes that everybody brought up is 
realize your limitations, um, and then do your best to bridge those gaps um, within within the known limitations. And um, I think a big part of that is asking the right questions, and that goes into the circular theme of what we've already kept saying about building relationships and motivational interviewing. Is um, you can't be assumptive that uh, someone's going to give you everything that you require to build a good intervention right off the bat. You need to pull and you need to probe by asking the right questions, and um, and I think that applies also to getting appropriate data, like you said, Mike, with HRV and uh, with visual stuff and, and anything else you can get is basically the more data you can get to make up for that lack of in-person um, visual data that you're constantly going to get or emotional data that you're going to get um, when you're with somebody in person is going to help bridge that gap. Um, but I do think as technology increases, we keep getting better and better. Uh, eventually, there's probably going to be virtual reality coaching and soon i probably like with the new vr stuff I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the next couple months um, yeah, and, um yes i just want to add one very quick thing i i shared this i think i told eric about this um but one thing i did a lot of fau in person was coached powerlifters all day every day um until we had meets and then i'd go and help them at the meets but i coach a lot of powerlifters online and something always felt like it was missing until I looked at Snapchat as a platform coaching tool. Now I have all of my lifters. Everyone has like full access to me via social media and all of my lifters on meet day will Snapchat me. I know wow. it's their meet day. I look for their Snapchats. They Snapchat me before weigh-ins. They Snapchat me after weigh-ins and I can like see them in real time and respond to them. You know, we use the RPE system um, in training and I, I'd spend a lot of time teaching them how to use that. So after their lift and that 60 seconds they have, whoever's with them, their mom, their brother, their sister, their friend, they Snapchat me, Hey Chad, attempt one felt great. I think I could have doubled it or whatever it may be. And then like, if there's no changes, I just give them the thumbs up and we keep going, you know, but using something that I thought was silly, like has really <laughs> increased, uh, Smart. you know, Smart. my, my joy in my client successes and power with me. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point and something I, I certainly never thought of. Um, nor nor will I be implementing, but I think it's I think, I think it's a I think it's a good idea. It's absolutely a good idea. Um, so if you want a Snapchat coach, go to Chad. <laughs> um, our fourth question is: There seems to be a lot of emphasis on finding motivation from external factors, either other people, quotes, music, etc. Do you think this could inhibit our progress if we rely on it too much? I'm the type of person who doesn't rely on that sort of stuff to get through a training session. Additionally, could getting too amped up be disadvantageous to our goals because of forgetting things like technique cues? Um, I'm going to try to consolidate that, that all into one question, um, which is basically a lot of people tend to be getting uh, motivation from external factors and is getting too excited uh, can it be a negative thing? Uh, so, Mike, would you like to start us on that? Since I know you've already talked about HRV and you've, I know you do, do a lot of nervous system stuff. Yeah, so you can look in the literature. There's all sorts of stuff on what's called external versus you know, internal motivation. Um, my bias is you mentioned that he doesn't appear to be the type of person to rely on that stuff too much to get to a training session. So in short, I'd say that's probably good. Um I think in the fitness industry, we do a good job of marketing to already people that are motivated, right? So a little motivational quote on Facebook, you know, all the fitness people are like, oh, it's cool, I'm going to go train today. I think to the entire outside world who's not into fitness, it actually does the opposite. I think it actually repels them away. Hmm. I go, oh my God, I'm never going to look like that. Screw all this fitness stuff. I'm going to go back to point. sitting on my couch eating ho-hos, <laughs> right? So I think it, it depends on the person. I think it kind of unfortunately splits everything off, which is a whole different discussion. Yep. Uh, so I think not relying on that, I think it's a good thing. Uh, from a pure performance standpoint, I will have people train under as many different circumstances as I can. So even if it's a, a strong meet or like a powerlifting meet, you know, I'll have them put on a, a tune that they absolutely hate because, oh my God, maybe you don't have your right song and you're doing your max attempt. Um, or sometimes it's like super quiet, 
and I was at a meet once that I did, and I had always trained with music, talked to Mika, yeah, here's your CDs, everything. I get there, and they had an amp problem, so they could barely get the announcer going. There was no music at all. And the crowd got like super quiet. It was almost like an Olympic weightlifting meet. And I was like, oh, this is so weird. <laughs> um, so just trying to prepare people for different stuff like that. Sure. Uh, last thing, too, can you get too amped up? Yes. In general, higher heart rate, higher levels of being more amped up can acutely increase gross motor skills, right? So on a large task or something that you're really, really experienced at, you can actually see a performance bump from that. However, you do tend to see a degradation of fine motor skills, right? So a generalization is you don't normally see too many Olympic weightlifters get super amped up for their lifts, but you see that more in powerlifting, you see it a little bit more in strongman, things of that nature. Um, so I think you each person, you know, is trying to find their, their happy medium. You know, you've got guys like, you know, Mike Tushir who are very quiet, very methodical and lift monster weights. Yeah. You've got other guys that get just amped out of their mind and do just as fine too. But right. one thing I, I have noticed is if people rely too much on that and they're a newer lifter and they're missing lifts, I would say you're probably too amped up and your motor skills are just going in the crapper. So just be aware of that and don't constantly rely on that especially at the beginning yeah i mean that was that was excellent you touched on every single aspect of that um i think the only thing that i would add just from a i guess from an anecdote is if if you are reliant excessively or constantly on extrinsic uh factors what happens when those are taken away? Do, do you do you exactly. stop training altogether? Like, do you just do you just give up? So I, I think I think there's a fine balance of recognizing that, especially in the world that we live in now, which is everybody who's going to be watching this is going to be watching it on social media, some some variation of that. So the extrinsic motivation is always available, but the reality is um, there are points where it doesn't quite give the punch that's necessary and i think in the the requirement to get up off your ass and go train um a motivating like facebook status update probably isn't going to get you out of your chair like um so so yeah i i guess i guess in short there, there is definitely a balance that's required of extrinsic versus instri- intrinsic can i add something as a coach perspective absolutely uh so in general um, the health belief model, which is a explanation of like fitness motivation, more or less, is I need to exercise to be healthy. Uh, it's got pretty poor performance in terms of compliance, so I like to try and combat uh, some of the, th- the reasons why that might be like a negative association bias. Um, you might have a great week of training and have one terrible session, and suddenly the whole week goes to crap. Okay, um, if you you know. That's all intrinsic motivation, too, with an external cue. So what I like to do is I like to essentially harness or cultivate positive intrinsic motivation that I can represent to my clients externally. So I'll, um, in periods of meet preps or contest preps, when when we start to start digging, um, I tell them to, like, I make another page in their spreadsheet, and I call it their daily ups log. And every day has a space, and every day they need to write one positive thing about their training session, but they can write as many as they want. So at the end of the day, whenever, you know, their motivation levels have tanked, something sets them off, they still look for one little positive and they can look back on, you know, 30 days of positive notes to themselves and just reaffirm themselves and keep themselves going. Um, That's a little bit of the subjective approach. And then of course, from, you know, collecting data as a coach, I can always just show them a graph. I'm like, hey, look, the data doesn't lie, dude. Like, we've got an upward slope here. You're doing good. Yep, absolutely. Momentum. Um, anybody else? Can I off that? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how people who have not really shared coaching philosophies come to similar things that are effective. I, I've used, like, gratitude journals, which there's a fair amount of uh, research showing that that can really help people keep a more positive mind frame because uh, perspectives and everything with some of my clients, uh, kind of similar to what you were saying, Chad. Um, and then uh, one thing to clarify, because I think these two terms have been a little blended by this question, 
is that motivation and arousal aren't necessarily the same thing, you know? Um, I think a lot of what Mike was talking about was, was arousal. There's a peak state of arousal for each athlete that may require you to be a little more amped up or a little less. And that might change over a career depending on how well ingrained your, your motor skills are. And then, like Mike said, how fine-tuned that motor skill is. And even a very high-level Olympic lifter might not be taking you know, half a gram of caffeine before a snatch while someone who's just doing a deadlift might, you know. Um, and I think the arousal discussion probably is more important for most dedicated fitness people or athletes. Uh, but I think motivation is probably much more important for people who struggle to stay with fitness. And like Mike said, are often turned off by this, the kind of messaging we get within people who are obsessed with fitness, which to be honest, we're the weird ones when you think about it. Yeah. Um, we like to do things that, that cause pain in the short term for a delayed gratification, which mm, not, doesn't really have any functional purpose, but may make us healthier, you know, um, to, to really kind of put an interesting perspective on, on it. And I would just say to anyone who is uh, constantly struggling to find motivation to be involved in fitness and doesn't really relate to us weirdos is that if you need a constant source of extrinsic motivation to do the fitness activity you're doing, it's probably not the right one for you. Uh, the reason why all of us stick with it, and the reason why I lift weights uh, way more than any I do anything else in my life is because I love it. So I think for each person who's trying to find their way in the fitness industry and trying to find consistency, which arguably is more important than anything else of what you're doing or how you do it is being consistent, is find something that you enjoy and, and that will trump everything else as far as your life enjoyment and health. Something uh, that you, you bring up, and it's funny because it was just half of a sentence that you said and taking half a gram of caffeine. And something that I've, I've noticed is, I wouldn't call it an epidemic. And um, I, think, I think I've noticed it as a consumer, uh, but also being involved in, in the supplement industry pretty pretty heavily involved is that um there's almost a reliance now on caffeine for a lot of people or their pre-workout supplement to to go in and train like a necessity and i think i think there's an important question someone has to ask themselves um if they need that to train um because or essentially train. yeah <laughs> yeah right I mean, basically, you are artificially needing to uh, dopamine yourself up to be happy about about what you're doing. Um, like, it's, it's almost like you're you're seeking uh, external motive motive. Well, again, extrinsic motivation, just not from a person or a voice from a, a compound. Um, and I do think that's something that that potentially uh, shouldn't go unnoticed because. Um, it might be saying something uh, if, if you need these escalating doses of stimulants to be excited about lifting. Um, so anyway, that was just a, that was, that was my tangent for this question. Um, but before we moved on, uh, anybody have any other input on, on that? I was just going to say, well, there goes all your utopian sales. But, uh, <laughs> well, I, I guess you I, well, here's the thing is like, I, and we'll probably end up talking about this. <laughs> we'll probably end up talking about this um, when we get into the supplement supplementation aspect. But uh, I do think there's different reasons why people get 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 into doing these things, and there's a reason why we're doing elements. Is like uh, educating people is more important than any any of this stuff. I mean, basically, formulating supplements for for me was doing something to get by the deception. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and there's still, I mean, we know that that's still super prominent. Like that's that is almost the exclusive thing for most people out there. Um, so, I mean, if people learn more and they stop buying taupe, okay, I'll just go work in a different, like a different job. <laughs> um, I'll just I'll just really become Walter White. Uh, but but yeah. Um, that I, I don't know. We'll we'll remember that one and we'll bring it back up during supplementation because I, I think a lot of those things are are good things to discuss at length. Next question is uh, a fairly long one. I'm going to try to put into one thing if we can, but I'll, I'll 
read it completely first. Uh, what should I be when I grow up? My question is in regards to education and perhaps more importantly life life's work and choosing a path. Having difficulty sorting out sorting it all out and perhaps your input will help. I've been profoundly fascinated with the human body from movement to physiology. Went back to school last year enrolling in health sciences with plans to transfer into exercise science. I learned a great deal in the last year. Ever, overall, I enjoyed it all. Uh, in many ways, I feel like I've just scratched the surface and there's so much more to discover now that I've got basic science down. I feel like I may be limiting myself to choosing exercise science. Pathology, pharmacology, and physiology are all subjects that I find in interesting. I've had at least three people in the last week suggest I go to medical school. Now I'm considering that. Where are my abilities best employed? How does one come to a decision? What are the important considerations we all had when choosing a major or program? Uh, how did we actually ultimately decide upon that? So I guess basically what made us choose to pursue the paths that we are now from all of the poten potential options we had, because we all start at undergrad needing to declare a major and now we're all here in this fitness thing so essentially we'll again go through the the whole panel and just uh we could give some perspective and insight in, on how we ended up here and um i guess what helped us make those decisions so jake you can start us off um i, I kind of want to so he's kind of asking like yeah, like he thinks maybe he wants to do something else. All right. I, 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 I know like, I know who this is, so it's Jen. So I just want to make sure we use the the appropriate. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah. My bad. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I don't know. It's really tough. Like I, I really identify with this question. I think because uh, although, uh, I. I went into school in, in undergrad as uh, pre-med and then later on switched to interdisciplinary pre-law and then took some philosophy and then eventually graduated uh, with a BS in kinesiology uh, and then decided I want to learn more and eventually got my master's. Uh, but I still don't I still am not sure if uh, exercise science is where I want to be. Uh, and so now I'm taking uh, more classes to, I don't know, maybe I'll do something I find chemistry interesting. Uh, I guess the, the answer for, for my perspective is, or not the answer, but how I feel is that just like choose a path and like kind of go forward and uh, you may, it, it's going to take you one way or another, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I guess I don't know, man. Like, I, I uh, it's, it's tough. yeah, th I guess, I guess I'd say, don't be so worried if the the path that you choose like isn't the right one later on down the road, uh, and. Uh, no, maybe you'll change or something. I don't know. Like, and, and I think they, <laughs> they also mentioned, like, yeah, like, I don't have a good answer. I think they mentioned, like, uh, the, like other people were saying, like, they should go to medical school or something like that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would say try not to let that influence your decision so much. And just kind of do what you like doing. As long as you like it, I think you'll be fine. And if you do it for a while and you discover that you don't like it, then do something else. Again, I'm going to withhold. We'll just we'll just go through everybody. Um, Chad, you're you're up next. I know everybody's going to have some some level of input on this. Um, I guess similar to Jake, I didn't know this is exactly what I w would want to do, and I just kind of got lucky picking exercise science. Um, I was never really the most athletically inclined individual growing up. And it was always something, you know, that was kind of unobtainable, you know, like varsity athlete, you know, star quarterback type deal. And I figured, you know what, why don't I just study it? It's interesting. There's got to be more to it. Um, trying to approach it from a different level. If I can't do it, maybe I can help someone else do it. So I thought I wanted to be a coach. I got into a division one internship, ended up you know, working with 
20 division one teams all day, every day, thought it would be the best year of my life. And I was like, this is the worst thing ever after the first day. And I realized that, um, you know, I, I, I knew I loved like, the body's ability to adapt and change to its situation. And we can kind of on a micro scale, you know, do that with exercise over and over and over again. Um, and I just, I just kept going like Jake, I wanted to know more answers, you know, just we do this because it's the way it is, wasn't good enough for me. So I just kept studying and I kept learning things. And, you know, every, every time that I thought I wanted to do something and I finally got there and I, I took that final step and I realized like this wasn't the end this wasn't the destination. This was just another rest stop on the journey, essentially. And, you know, in the last eight years of my education, um, you know, straight through the whole time in college, it's, it's just perspective is, you know, another two to three years to get my PhD and the postdoc, um, you know, going to be, going to be worth it for a 30 year long career that I love. Well, what happens if I finish my PhD and I decide I don't exactly want to do what I just set myself up to do? Am I going to be unhappy for 30 years or am I going to re-specialize and train for another three and, get, and try again? Yeah. You know, it's, you, you only, you only have self-imposed time limits and it's going to take a lot of self-exploration to really find, to carve out your own path. You don't need to follow anybody else's, you know, just, take everything as it is and make decisions that apply to you at that time. Eric? I think that's really, it's really easy to say like, Oh man, I'm already like 27. It's, it's too late. to, <laughs> yep. to let go or whatever. But, uh, yeah, you can always uh, try to find a way to do something different or what you want to do. Well, again, especially in the, in the environment we have, I mean, relative comparison is is electronic life. I mean, you log in anywhere and you, you can compare yourself immediately to where everybody else is. Whether one can argue whether that's a, a true image that someone is putting out there or not, that's that can, again, go down another rabbit hole. But, but the reality is, um, I think those existential, you know, potential crises uh, are increased because of the way that we currently live um it's like someone shows you they're happy doing this and your in interpretation from that those pixels on the screen are like oh they're ecstatic but i'm not right now they must love their life and i hate mine like it's we it's just weird inappropriate um relative comparison but i'm gonna shut up because i want to keep move on eric yeah i i have a lot to say about I'll, I'll try to keep it concise Go. um so you can't know what you're going to want to do, um, but you can have, but you're probably the person who's going to have the best idea out of anybody. And the longer you've been alive and being self-aware while you're alive, the more accurate that guess is going to be for the future. Uh, but you can know what you want right now, most of the time. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a self-example. I, I didn't start studying exercise science or became interested in lifting weights or helping others do that until I had already gone down a completely divergent career path. I uh, wanted to get into the FBI, UN and the Air Force, learning a foreign language, getting into counterintelligence. And then that was something I'd wanted to do since I was like five. You know, I wanted to be freaking G.I. Joe and, and, uh, and, and super cop kind of thing. And once I actually got into that field and pretty close to the end goal of that path, I was like, oh, shit, I don't want to do this. And once I realized that, I did something else. I think the two factors that are going to make you happy in life are chasing your passion and then having the courage and the grit to keep going for it. And that also includes, once you realize that your passion has changed, having the courage and the grit to change and do something else. Um, so I think passion trumps everything. I, it's easy for me to say that because I'm somebody who's always just kind of naturally done what I want. But the second part, grit, is not something I always had, and that was something I had to learn because uh, I was afraid of failure or afraid of putting my all into it and not achieving, uh, and, and that becomes a self-imposed barrier. Um, and I think another thing we have to realize is it's never too late. No one cares how old you are. Uh, people, all the perceptions about age 
are all related to things that we think are related to age. We think someone who's 55 won't know how to use technology or relate to other people. But if they maintain relationships with other people of different age groups and use technology, they'll have it. You know, it, 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 so all of these self-imposed barriers are just that. So there's no harm in changing your academic career after you've already had a PhD and starting over completely. Uh, I, I mean, what's the alternative? You live the next 55, 60 years unhappy or, or settling. Uh, I think all you can ever do is, is your best guess currently of what's going to make you happy. And if you're not doing that, then the only other option is not being happy, which, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ethan? Yeah, I, you guys are making a lot of good points with all of this. Um, I guess one thing, though, that, like, I kind of, I guess, struggle with this myself. Like, I'm still an undergrad right now, um, and I seem to, like, experience a lot of the time, like, almost like a the grass is always greener on the other side type of syndrome in terms of, like, man, if I had, like, majored in this instead of what I'm doing now, that, that would be probably really cool. Um, and sometimes I have to remind myself, like, it's okay to, that I chose this current path. And like, to some extent, learning about other subjects will still exist in some capacity, no matter what, which kind of goes back to the whole barrier idea that you guys have been talking about. But another thing to keep in mind is that you don't necessarily have to make your career out of something that you're interested in you don't necessarily have to use an institution uh to further your learning over a subject um like with as much like technology has just been i feel like making the flow of information just rapidly expand and we have like access to so much knowledge and i mean just go to wikipedia and you can learn a lot of things that you're interested in you don't necessarily have to, I guess, major in it um, at an institution and make a career out of it to fulfill that curiosity. Um, and I think, I think that's a lesson that I've actually recently been learning, um, that the capacity to learn exists in other areas besides just going to school for it or making a career out of it. Mike? Yeah, I mean, I can, to answer the med school question for super quick, The because I kind of looked at that initially when I did the first four years of college, and the big question to ask yourself then is, do you want to play in that system? And if you don't want to play in that system, med school's probably not very, <laughs> very good for you. Um, if you want to, and that's your passion, then cool, yeah, go for it. But, but in your case, it kind of sounds like it's what other people are kind of telling her she may want to do. Um I can tell you in general, probably don't do the path I did and don't spend 18 years in college full time and trying to figure out what you're trying to do. Um, but the same point, I don't really regret it either. So I actually did a Bachelor of Arts and then two years, another two and a half years to get a master's in mechanical engineering. I uh, worked in the medical device industry for quite a while. And at that point, I decided, well, I'll go back to school again, sort of taking physiology. Everyone's like, oh, well, you should do your. PhD in biomedical engineering. I'm like, well, that eh, kind of sounds interesting, but I was looking back at it now, I was spending all my free time reading exercise physiology, even at that point. We didn't really know what to do with it. So I put four years into a PhD program in biomedical, and eventually my blinding flash of the obvious I had one day was what if I just drop out of this program and switch to exercise phys? Yeah, 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 I'd have to start all over again, but. Fast forward how many years it takes me to complete my degree, what do I actually do? And what I realized was, oh, I already have a job and everything now, and if no one gives a rat's ass, I could still keep <laughs> doing what I'm doing now. Um, so it wasn't this horrible catastrophe thing, I'd be living in a van down by the river <laughs> or anything like that, if it all works out. So... At that point, I actually dropped out and then went over to the uh, kinesiology department. Fortunately, that took me seven years to, to finish that. And eventually, after I finished that, I just left uh, working in the medical device industry altogether. I'd been training people and doing my business on the side for quite a few years before that. Um, 
But, you know, that whole process, I started college when I was 18. I graduated when I was uh, 38, you know. So the reality is no one cares. No one gives a rat's ass. You know, it's just do what you want to do. Like Eric said, you're not going to know 20. If someone said, okay, you're 18, here's what you're going to be doing 20 years from now, I would have said, that's insane. There's no way yeah. I'm going to be doing that. Yeah. But, you know, it, it happens. And there's no way I think you should be able to put the pressure on yourself to figure out exactly what that is. You know, just like they said, do what you want to do. And then spend some time thinking about once you're done, whether that's four years, two years, you know, eight years, whatever. What is it you want your day to look like? What impact do you want to have? And then work backwards from that. So if you want to be teaching at a university, yeah, you're probably going to need to get a master's or a PhD. If you want to work at the local gym being a trainer, yeah, maybe, maybe not. You know, get a minimum certification, start working. Do you actually like doing that? You know, there's no real right or wrong. I think it's just being okay to take the actions moving forward and then just kind of change along the way if you need to. 